So for those of you um, whose English isn't your first language, repeatable just means you can do it again and again in the same way. And how that technical process can be applied to different styles of throw and different types of shot. Now, those of you that know the um, World Botcher website might know that there's already a video on there, which is about technical process. Um, and I put the link at the bottom here, and I think we're going to copy that into the chat function for you. But it's good for you to get to know that if you go to the World Botcher uh, website, look, at, look for documents, and then you'll find development as part of that, and then development deliver. Uh, de mm development videos. And this particular video um, actually has delivery as the main word you could see. But if you look at the very top of it, it does say principles of coaching, technical process. However, the link I put in here will take you straight to that. So what is a technical process? Well, we've identified four stages, the setup, preparation, delivery, and follow through. And if we look at what it says on here, setup is when the player adopts the correct position to deliver the ball. Preparation is when the, the player completes their final preparations for delivering the ball. Delivery is when the player releases the ball into play. And follow through is when players complete their delivery, hopefully in a controlled and consistent manner. So here's a good example of an athlete who has completed their setup. So if we look, setting up really is about lining up. It's about adopting the right position. And I picked this shot in particular because it's an athlete who doesn't throw in a similar way to other athletes. And it's really important for us to know that a technical process is individual to every athlete we work with. And whilst there might be some athletes that have a similar technical process, it's very likely that different athletes will have different processes or need to concentrate on or think about different parts of that process. So for this player, his wheelchair is at the right angle for him to play the shot. His body is at the right position for him to play the shot. The chair is stabilized by the assistant and the body is stabilized through, I imagine, core strength, but also we can see parts of the wheelchair, maybe some strapping and restraints and things that are helping him to get into that best position. So the BC3 player in this first picture is in the process of setting up. So they're lining, he's lining up his ramp. So that lining up applies to your wheelchair, your body, and if you're a ramp user, your ramp as well. The BC1 player we can see, young David Smith, um, has completed his setup. We look closely, he's gone right to the back of his box. He's got his wheelchair at an angle that so he's lined up with the shot that he wants to take. He's sitting up straight and we can just see his non-throwing arm holding on to the side of the chair. So his setup is complete. The next phase is the preparation phase. And this is the bit just before delivery. So it might include things like rounding the ball, Placing the ball for an athlete, um, maybe on a ramp or in this case, under the athlete's foot or in front of the athlete's foot. And then the athlete may want to rehearse the shot or visualize the shot. So think about it in their mind, um, uh, rehearse it physically or rehearse it mentally. So this BC1 kicker has asked his assistant to round and place the ball. And now he's fine tuning exactly where he wants the ball before he propels it onto the court. He's probably going to look up next towards the intended position that he wants this ball to go to before he actually kicks it. That's all part of his preparation phase. 
And if we take that into uh, two slightly different phases here, so this is preparations phase, sorry, still, but we've got a BC1 player. Again, pick something quite unusual. We don't see many BC1 assistants that fix the chair like this. But the key when we're working with a technical process is how do we overcome difficulties and how do we find the right thing for that player? And I presume there's a reason that foot is up there on the side of the chair. Possibly the player lifts and their wheelchair bounces or something like that. But they've decided that that's part of what they need to do to get that best shot away in the most consistent and controlled manner. And then the BC3 player, they've got themselves in exactly the right position. So um, Jess might have had her assistant may have helped her to move her head or to move her a head pointer to get it in exactly the right place, to touch the ball in exactly the right place. Um, and the assistant has placed the ball exactly where she's been asked to on the ramp. Obviously, the rest of the preparation in lining up the ramp, getting the angles right and everything will already have been done. The third phase is the delivery phase. So this is about releasing the ball into play. And we can just see that the, the BC3 player here has just released that ball. If you can see at the end of the head pointer, it's almost like a little circle. And that would have sat, I think, on top of the ball to hold it onto the ramp. And he's then released it by lifting it up. So that release point is the delivery point. And it's controlling the line and pace because of the way the ramp's been set up. But in terms of a throw or a kick, actually that release of the delivery part is the last piece leading up to the, the release of the ball as well. And might also control the trajectory. That's the arc that it might make through the air if you've got an airborne shot. So if we look at this BC1 player, um, the two photo photos show the same player at the beginning of his delivery and the end of his delivery. Uh, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that one's with the jack ball and one's with the red ball, so it's not the same shots. But actually, there's they're still good um, things that show that he's doing something very similar with both shots. We can see some of the things he's done beforehand because we can see how he stabilised himself. Can you see that arm that's around the back of his chair? And then the opposite foot that's hooked around um, a little pole that's down by the wheel. And so he's wedging himself in a way between those two stabilising points. And that would all have been part of his setup. So the follow through completes the throwing movement, ideally with a smooth release and usually holding the finishing position. It's often slightly exaggerated. So you might hold that finishing position for a few seconds before you move back to maybe sit in your chair. And many players will end up pointing towards their intended target, but that won't be true for everybody. You've got to work out what works for you and what works for your shot or what works for your player and their shot. So here we have um, one of our BC1 players again. He's holding his finishing position. And we can just see here that actually he's staying down in that shot. At the same time, his assistant is moving forward, ready to pull him back and pull him into that seating position again. So the player is staying down. His ball, I think, was the red one at the side there. Um, but that's gone and he's still in that position. But also, if we look to the right and we see our BC3 player, we can see that the ball is already well down the ramp, but the hand is still lifted up as they've released it. So they've taken the hand up off the ball as smoothly as possible and they're holding that. And that helps to make sure that they don't maybe swipe across the ball when they let go of it. They're trying to let go of it so they don't impart any spin and the ball rolls down the ramp smoothly and goes nice and straight.
So this is a, a really nice uh, thing. If any of you have done the coaching course, you might have seen this before. So it's a lovely timeline of one player going through their entire technical process. So we can see in the setup at the beginning that they are selecting the right ball, getting it into their hand well. They've moved their body over into the position they want it to be when they deliver the ball. They're then doing preparatory swings. Just notice the other hand is holding on so that they can reach over just the right amount to get that shoulder outside of the wheel so that the arm can swing freely underneath the shoulder. And then as that swing comes through, look at how during the preparation phase, we can see the swing coming forwards and then going back again and then coming forwards again. We can see that point of delivery where the ball is just coming out of the hands and the follow through, which is staying really, really straight. So just have a little look at that again and look along that setup preparation, delivery and follow through. So this is the point where we're going to, to move on and start to little, think a little bit more about uh, one or more players that you work with. It's really useful if, at this point if you have uh, paper and pen or something if you want to make notes on or whatever. The first thing we're going to think about is what does your player do? And it might be a good idea to think of somebody that's more at the end of being a beginner rather than somebody who's um, an international player. Is the international player will have their four stages probably, but they'll probably have a lot of elements to each stage. Whereas your beginner might not even have the four stages as they might not have a technical process at all. So I want you to, first of all to imagine in your head, think about how do they throw or kick or ramp? How do they propel the ball onto the court? And what type of throw or kick or ramp release do they do? Now, you might actually have um, on your mobile phone, if you take any video footage, to be a good time to maybe try and look for that, because that would help you then. You don't have to envisage it. You could actually look at um, their delivery. And then what I really want you to think about is, do you think they have those four stages within their process? So we might not call it a technical process yet, because they might not have had the opportunity to do that. So can you just write down, maybe think about what does your player do when they're successful? When they do a really good shot, what have they done? So can you write down some bullet points for yourself? What does your player do when they throw a good shot or deliver a good shot? So while you're looking down at your page and thinking about what to put in, I'm just going to remind you those stages are set up when you might be lining up your chair, your ramp, your body. Preparation, where you might be preparing the ball, the position of the ball on the ramp or in front of your foot or um, so that you can um, pick the ball up. You might be doing some preparatory swings and starting to think about how you're going to throw. And there's that point of delivery, letting go of the ball and the bit that leads up to that and the follow through at the end. But hopefully now you've sort of written down from that roughly what you think your player, the player you've got in your mind is doing at the moment. So very new players, if we think of somebody that's really new, I find one of the things that lots of new players don't do is they don't move their chair. 
They're very happy to sit in their chair and they'll try and turn their body to get to different angles and things. So straight away, we can see a mismatch between what we'd like to see in a technical process and what they're actually doing. Another real common one is somebody who's not used to the different bocce balls will throw a bocce ball. They have no idea that it needs to be rolled and rounded and really prepared so that it will throw the best way. So that's another thing that preparation of rounding the ball first might not be happening. If you've got maybe a new BC1 or BC3 assistant, they might not know to round the ball. Advanced players are probably going to have all of these and they might have any number of steps within each one. Advanced players are going to have a lot of things they do to set themselves up, but they become habitual because they practice them so often. So as coaches, the first thing we can do is observe. So let's have a look first of all and see if any parts of the technical process are missing. So we can look at the whole thing and then see, can we identify a setup? Is there a time where they're lining up their body, their ramp, their chair? Are they preparing anything? Are they just rushing straight into making a shot to just pick the ball up and chuck it? Or actually, are they doing something to get ready to deliver that shot? How do they deliver it? Is it fairly random or fairly consistent? We're really looking for consistency. So we're looking for a delivery that looks the same. And do they follow through? Or as soon as that shot's away, are they sort of back out the way again? So what we're now looking for is, is anything missing? So think about your player again. Maybe go back to what you wrote down that you thought they're doing at the moment. Is there something missing? That's what you need to note next. So this is going to help you because maybe the next time you go back to them, if they're not lining up, well, you can go back and you can start working on setup with them. And once we've identified the bits of the technical process that are missing, we can explain what a technical process is and, and hopefully uh, in 20 minutes, 10 minutes, you'll be able to explain why we're going to do it as well. Um, and you can start to build that technical process. And what we're always aiming for is we want to control the line, the pace and the trajectory. So trajectory means it's going through the air. So is it going to make an arc in the air? Is it going to go up and come down straight and land? How do you want it to fly through the air? So that obviously doesn't apply to BC3 players, but it does apply to anybody else who is throwing uh, and some kickers, because some of our kickers kick along the ground, but others are able to pick the ball up with their toes and throw it. So think about now, we're going to think about something which is an outcome. How good is your player at controlling line? And separately, how good are they at controlling pace? And if it's appropriate, how good are they at controlling trajectory? I would say that the line is the easiest thing to control. So I would work on that first. And then I would develop the pace. And then I would think about the trajectory. So we've got a technical process, something's happening, we can see all those four parts and now we want to try and improve it. So let's first of all observe again and when we observe we look at the whole thing. So we look at the whole shot and then we split it down. So we're looking at each of those four parts and I'm going to keep saying them so we keep remembering them. It's set up, it's preparation, it's delivery, it's follow through. And when we're observing, we're going to observe from different angles, because depending on what you're looking at, if you're looking for line. You might want to be directly behind or directly in front to be able to see the line that the shot's going in and to see whether that hand is going down that line, that follow through is going down that line or whether when the ball comes out of the ramp, it's going straight and so on. 
But if you're looking for trajectory, for instance, you may want to go from the side of the chair and you should go from the side nearest to the hand or foot that's releasing the ball so that you can see exactly where that release point is. Does it need to be a bit earlier or a bit later to get the height that you want and the, the um, arc of the ball that you want? So I'm just, I've just missed my, uh, my notes here. I'm just gonna catch up with myself. It's very strange that I should uh, lose my notes at that particular point because it says, what is working for your athlete now? Do you tell them? And this is I've got a big smiley face next to this in my notes because um, I do what I know a lot of coaches do. We look for the ways that we can add value. So we look to correct the player. And if we're not careful, we forget to tell them what they're already good at. So um, I think it's really funny. I'm smiling to myself a lot here that actually the thing that's working well, we need to tell them. So if they're doing great lining up every time, let them know they're doing great lining up, really reinforce that so they keep doing it. That also helps that to become an automatic thing. They line up well every time. We know we don't really have to focus on lining up because they do it and they're really good at it um, and so on. So. What do we see that isn't working? Because if something isn't working or it isn't consistent, actually don't intervene straight away. What we really need to do is to look several times. So is this a consistent fault? Are they always doing the same thing that's not working? Or actually, maybe it was a spasm. Maybe it was a mistake. And something happened. Can the athlete correct that themselves? So a very new athlete might not know how to correct it, but your more experienced athletes may already know, yeah, I know exactly what I did then, let me do it again because I can put it right next time. So we don't intervene the moment we see something that's not working. We wait to see if it's a thing, if it's really not working. And then we go in and say, I think this might be what's happening. OK, and we give that feedback. This obviously is where um, your video footage and everything else is really useful, especially if they've got quite a quick shot, because you can take that footage, you can slow it down, you can show it to the athletes that they are also understanding what you're doing. And, you know, as far as your interventions, the more experience you get, the more ideas you'll have, the more likely you are to have an idea that's going to work. But your player might also have suggestions and it's okay if your suggestions aren't the right ones first okay it's okay if you try something and it doesn't work and I've done that many times I've tried things with athletes and we've ended up laughing our heads off going yeah that's maybe not the thing we're going to do <laughs> that's not going to work for you and sometimes you come up with something completely new and you're amazed that it works and other times uh, you just come up with something that six other people are doing and that works for your athlete as well. So you just never know. Allow yourself to fail. Okay, if you allow yourself to fail, you embrace that, eventually you'll find the thing that works and that'll be the thing you're going to stick with. But don't worry about the errors and don't worry as a coach, it is better to try something and get it wrong than not to try it at all for fear of failure. Okay. So, also be specific. So we're not, we can't try and improve everything in one go. So we might be looking to improve line. And we might say, you know, the biggest thing that's going to affect your control of line is that you're not lining up your chair very well at the beginning. So you really focus in on that one thing that you need to be doing. Or maybe linking two things together. It's delivery and follow through that's going to work together. Whatever. So you really try and hone in on what is it we want to improve and how we're going to improve it. And that way, it's very easy to measure whether you've improved. If you're trying to improve overall accuracy, that includes line and pace. It's really hard. You don't know what's going to change it. It's very difficult to measure whether you've made any improvement. 
Um, and allow the athlete to self-correct. I put that at the end there because I do think that's important. You know, we mustn't intervene straight away. We must let them get on with things. So once your player can repeat their technical process, this should also lead to being able to repeat the outcome. And it is that way. It's process first and then you get the outcome. Sometimes you can repeat the outcome with two completely random different things, but that's just lucky. Okay, that's not skill. But actually, we want to develop the skill to be able to repeat something and get the same outcome each time. So the obvious area is jack and first ball. If you can throw out your jack and your first ball in the same way, they're going to end up in a very similar position. I'm amazed at uh, some of the very, very experienced athletes I know who don't stress about their jack. As long as the jack goes over the jack ball line, they're like, that's fine, I've thrown the jack out. They don't even think about how they've thrown the jack. It's so automatic to them. And then they start to think when they've got the coloured ball in their hand. And my question to them is, how do you know that you're going to throw this coloured ball in the same way that you've thrown the jack ball? And they don't because they don't know how they threw the jack ball. They just threw it. So actually, that's a really good place to start. Can you throw your jack ball and your first ball the same way? And in fact, you can get any two balls and just get that two balls to the same place, two balls to the same place. That's the start of knowing that you've got a repeatable technical process. So there's another thing to think about. Do you think that your athlete throws their jack and first ball in exactly the same way? Now, if you've got advanced athletes, they may not want to throw them exactly the same because they might want one to be a little tiny bit shorter than the other one, leave a little bit of a gap, etc. That's fine. But kind of aiming this more at your newer athletes and being able to develop this for the first time. So what they do, what they think, what they feel should all be the same. It's all part of that technical process. And developing a consistent technical process should lead to increased success. And that in turn develops greater self-belief. And you start to be able to go into a match, instead of having an outcome goal, I want to win, you can have a process goal. I want to nail my jack and first ball on each of my ends. That is a measurable goal. We can see straight away whether you've managed to get you, you might have a parameter. I want to get my, my first ball within 25 centimetres of my jack ball. Or it might be I want to get my first ball absolutely in line between my jack ball and my opponent. Whatever is reasonable and achievable for your player. And that's a process goal and it is achievable. The outcome goals are things that we can't control usually. So I might want to win. But if I'm playing against the world champion, probably not going to win. <laughs> so I can't control that because I can't control what the world champion does. But the more I can believe in my technical process and those abilities, I can start being confident that I can deliver those balls. So you can have this kind of phrase that you can say to yourself to help with your confidence. I know that when I complete my technical process, I can make the shot. Once we've got a basic technical process, we can develop and adjust this for different shot types and lengths. So I would, as I said before, I, I would start with controlling line. Um, where most players getting the setup and the follow through correct is likely to have the most influence. Now, as I've said before, there's all sorts of other things that could be there. So it could be that you've got a very wobbly body which hasn't been stabilised. That could have a massive effect on the line of the ball. So you have to look at your athlete and see which is the part that they're not controlling as well and that they might be able to control better through your interventions. If we move on to controlling pace, it's quite possible that the preparation and delivery phases are going to have more influence because perhaps in a pendulum shot, the number of swings you take, the height of your swings, that kind of thing, you might actually overswing and be going wildly, you know, 
uh, so just going far too fast, um, or you might underswing and not build up the amount of um, speed that you need to get that correct pace. And then for airborne shots like the lob, the point of release and the power that you put into the shot is most likely to affect the distance and the shape of that trajectory. And look, there are no shortcuts here. You have to develop each shot at each distance for each player. And each one might be quite different. So, you know, somebody who comes in new to the sport and expects to be in Paris in 2024, that's an awful lot of work they've got to put in to have that full range of shots. Uh, and that's probably what a lot of our players, when they come in new, don't realise how much hard work there is to do to control everything to this level. Um, and really what I'm saying here as well is these are examples. There will be many more factors. This goes back to your observation and you look in at what you would like to see, control of the setup, control of the preparation, control of the delivery and the follow through. Where, it, where is that shot going out of control? What can you do to change that? So we've all heard of uh, key performance indicators. I think KPIs in sort of business and other times. And I'm not sure if I've heard of it in Gotcha before, but it's, it's something I like to use. Um, and to, to me, there are things that each individual player needs to remember in each shot. So you can imagine we could have player A who might line up really well for every shot. So it's not something they need to particularly think about, whilst player B might forget to line up. So that would be a key performance indicator for player B. If they remember to line up, they play better. And then when they don't, they play worse. So the word line or the phrase line up might be a really important thing for them to remember as part of their technical process. Whereas that player A who does it automatically, they can concentrate on another part. I wouldn't usually give a player more than maybe three or four things to think about on any given shot. And you need to assess the amount of information that your player can cope with. So again, we do work with players with learning disabilities and, and with all sorts of um, specific learning issues as well. So we do need to think about what's going to be the most important to them and also what they can remember well. So you may just have to be looking at one thing at a time until that's embedded and until you can add something else. And you also got to remember to change in your mind what success looks like. Success for one player could be getting to within a meter of the jack and success for another is touching the jack in front of it. So be realistic with that and how much you think you can actually improve each individual's um, technical process. So as you develop different shots with the same player, different um, KPIs might emerge. So as an example, player A doing a placement shot, um, they might be a bit of a fast player. So their three um, performance indicators might be calm, breathe, shot, okay? But when you need them to add power, that might change to breathe because actually you want them to breathe with the shot they're making, to breathe out and get that strength from it. And because we know that at the end of power, you often change the line, then that follow through might be important. So the three KPIs for a power shot might be breathe, straight, point. So they're pointing at where they want to ball to, that ball to go at the end. So you can see layup shot or a placement shot, calm, breathe, straight. But a power shot, breathe, straight, point. And that little change might just mean they can think about the difference, what's most important in that shot. That technical process just changes slightly so that they can add the power to that shot. So an experienced player will be using their technical process throughout every match. Sometimes with just those small changes to the basic. 
and sometimes with completely different processes for different throws and different shot types. And it takes years to get that kind of skill, but it's something that everyone can aspire to. So here's an example. You go in, you set the jack. We've had a, that's a good early kind of skill, those two repeatable identical shots. Can you do the same technical process in the same way, one after the other? Then a little bit further into that end, you might need a push off shot. So you might need to add some power. Um, you might not need to add too much power, but you still need to focus on maintaining that line. So this time in your technical process, you're adding power and maintaining line. A bit further on, you can see a real opportunity if you can lob, maybe you want to get the jack off the back of a group of balls. So this time you've got to really focus on where you release the ball so you can control that trajectory. So again, possibly a very similar technical process, but focusing on a different part of it to get the right uh, lob. And then maximising score at the end. Who can think of a player who, when they see an opportunity to get lots of points, gets the first couple of balls in and then gets so excited about it that they don't get the others in? What's actually happening is they're forgetting their technical process. They're either thinking it's too easy or it's too hard or they're putting pressure on themselves. The concentration goes at the end of the match and they have an opportunity to score four points and actually they only get two. But it's actually you've got to train them to just keep going back, keep doing the same thing. That's maybe player A, they're going to need to be calm and breathe and straight. And they have to keep doing that same thing. So can you do that technical process when you're under pressure? There we go. So um, this is a link to a um, video that's on the botch on the World Botcher YouTube. Um, this was taken in Poffer in 2019. It's a match between uh, Claire Taggart and uh, Hidetaka Sugimura. I hope I said that name right. Um, and uh, actually, Andre Tavares and myself are discussing technical processes as part of that. So it's quite good to, to watch. You can, I think with Claire particularly, you can really see how she uses her breathing as part of her technical process. And, and she, you can quite visibly see the stages she's going through. So I think it's quite a good match to, to watch. I think we're going to put that in the um, chat function for you. And if you started about 10 minutes, because there's a bit at the beginning where the camera's rolling and we're not commentating at all. So start about 10 minutes in um, and that will be fine.